And can you see me at the top hello, of my head? Hello, hello. Welcome to this very special session. I'm so excited to be joined today by the wonderful Dr. Linda Tellington Jones. Thank you so much for being here with us. First of all, Linda, welcome. My pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give Roland an earbud so he can hear you. Okay, perfect. That will be good. So we have been trying to bring together some time with Linda for quite a while now. And, you know, we just surrender to knowing that it's it comes together when it's meant to and it's and it's now. So I'm so very grateful. Um, so what we're going to be learning about today is tea touch. This is a wonderful healing touch technique for animals that Linda has created and created many, many years ago. I'll do a little more formal introduction of her and then Linda's going to give us some further instructions of what is it all about. Out, what is it good for and how do you do it and then you know we'll be able to get into some more details from there and with Linda is also her friend Lavette the human um, to the yes. side there of Linda as well as the little fur baby in the middle Bella Mia who is a did you say 16 year old Chihuahua yes yes she's 16 Oh, so what a sweet baby there. So we're going to be able to see today some of the tea touch technique applied to an animal firsthand. So that'll be a lot of fun. So first, let me introduce Linda a little bit more. They are there on the big island right now, which is so nice. I wish I could have been there to do this interview in person. <laughs> Next that time. That would have been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, probably a little easier too. <laughs> so That's first true. of all, let me just share a little bit more about Linda. She is an internationally recognized teacher, author, and equine expert. She has developed, as mentioned, the world-renowned healing method known as T-Touch, Tellington Touch, coming from her last name. For the past 50 years, she has helped animals, taught people, and trained practitioners in this revolutionary method of healing touch. And this hands-on technique is known to help animals with their behavioral challenges, physical challenges, and much more, which is what Linda will certainly explain more about. And Linda, what I thought was really cool when I was just kind of putting together my information and looking into more to learn more about you myself is that last year you received the recipient of the Torchbearer Award for Peace for Linda's lifelong devotion to the development of a heart-based method that nurtures a unique, peaceful connection between animals and people. How cool is that? You literally won the award for that. She joins millions around the world who are dedicated to Sri Chin Moy's ever-blossoming dream of global oneness and peace within, which I just found extra special because I know Sri Chin Moy. I know of him. We share a birthday, by the way, August 27th. Oh, my goodness. How yes. amazing. <laughs> and I have read a lot of his books and uh, studied yoga with his lineage um, at some time when I was down in San Diego. So I'm familiar. And it's wonderful that you have been connected and are serving his mission as well. Yes. <laughs> <A> treasure. <laughs> yes, truly. So congratulations on that well-deserved award. So with that said, Linda, let's get into it. Yeah, just let us, you know, give us a little explanation of what is Tea Touch. When first, you know, you were telling me the beginnings of, and I said, let's definitely share this with the world, you know, how you got into all of this in the first place. Where did it come from? How did it come through you? And then go ahead and share with us more about the technique. Yes, and uh, well, while I'm speaking, I just want to give you a little idea what I'm doing here with Bella, because at 16, she's not used to being with other people. And it took quite a while to get her to realize that I was safe. And I, I just want to explain how I did it with uh, Lavette first holding her and of course not approaching her from the front, but approaching her from the back and using her little blankie. And I actually did two catches on, on Lavette first with her blanket so she could see it. And I licked my lips and turned so she could turn my head away. So when she was afraid, I showed her that I was hearing her. Mm -hmm. And the, what you just saw is a pretty much of a little miracle because she walked over to me here like this and turned around. And, and that just doesn't happen, right? It's right. just, it just doesn't it's just happen. A it's a first at 16. Yes. And I'm just going to let her sniff me. That's a, this is really a little miracle. And let's knowing that we're all one. And I know that's where you come from, Amanda. <laughs> and 
on this wonderful work, knowing that we can make a difference in the world for all animals who are afraid, just by remembering that oneness and knowing that by bringing that to this little being, is a very good girl. And I touch her first with a brush, yes. And when she dares to overcome her fear in this way, that we're sending that feeling out to the planet, out to the universe. And that's actually at the heart of the Kellington Tea Touch. So I'll, I'll tell you how I got started. I was blessed to be raised on a farm in Canada. And when I was six, my father had to buy a horse for me to ride to school because north of Edmonton, Alberta, there were no school buses in our time. And most kids walked. And I got to ride to school on my own horse with my cousins. So um, when I was nine, we moved closer to Edmonton. And I um, was still rode to school. But I was only a mile and a half from a wonderful stable called Briarka Stable. And um, the riding teacher, Mrs. Alice Metherall, was a very, very uh, knowledgeable trainer and teacher. And so I started coming after school and riding two or three horses every day after school, just preparing them for showing. And um, I, I wound up um, marrying a man 20 years older than I went with Kellington. And he was he graduated in the last cavalry class from Norwich University the year I was born in 1937. And so we actually started a school and um, a school for riding instructors and trainers. Just be careful that she doesn't jump down. Yeah. And um, we had students who come who came to us for like nine months. And um, we had students from nine countries and 36 states. So I was just blessed to have this background. The way I got started with the dogs, I mean, every horse person I know of has a dog. And we actually bred Great Danes on our ranch and for companion dogs. And, you know, they're just, they're natural uh, guard dogs. You don't have to teach a Great Dane. They know what the job is and they do it really well. And um, then I started with teaching with dogs, I actually started a certification program in 1993, because until then we'd had much success just doing like weekend workshops. And what we found in, in my very first training, certification training, we had, we started that year doing these trainings where you do like six trainings over two or three years, depending on which country you're in. And, um, and what we found is that people just found it a whole new way to approach dogs. And one of the basis of our, of our training is this concept that we learn to listen to the whispers of the horses or the dogs or the other animals that we work with. And it's, a, it's another way of relationship. And you would understand this because it's a relationship from the heart rather than thinking that we dominate animals, that we come to a place of understanding. Now, how we do this with our dogs is, it's not just tea touch. I mean, Tellington tea touch is, and the second T by the way in tea touch uh, is trust. And that's what we do is develop a relationship of trust. Hmm. And how we do it is first of all, by the work on the body, which I'm going to show you a little bit on Bella. We do it by these ground exercises that we call a playground for higher learning because with using the labyrinth and various types of grounds that, you know, like a footing that animals, that dogs go over, um, that give them a sense of uh, being grounded <laughs> and um, all kinds of different harnesses and equipment. And we have, um, I brought this out here. This book, All Wrapped Up, is a book that my sister Robin Hood, um, oops, if you can see it, uh, um, produced. And because Robin teaches around the world, just like I do and any of her other teachers. And um, 
the so we do wraps we do all kinds of special equipment and harnesses that over the years we've developed and um then we have in addition to that we have our philosophy and our basic philosophy is that our animals are our teachers and that when when we learn to listen that we can develop a very different relationship and i you know, um, in the horse world and in the dog world, it's thought that if, a, say, a dog does something that, you know, is not what we want, that they should be punished for it. Because when a dog is aggressive, you need to meet that with aggression. It's, you know, the old way of doing things. And it's still out there. And I completely changed that. Because in, in the past, until 1981, if a horse bit or kicked, I would like, you know, just give them one good whack and show them that's not what to do. Or if a dog attacked another dog, I would give them a, you know, I'd really get after them. And thank God for Ho'oponopono because I know that dogs forgive us. And I think that most people who have worked with a lot of animals have done things that we wouldn't do today. And in 1981, I completely changed that attitude of punishment when i read in the course in miracles the statement one sentence that changed my life with animals and that is that aggression comes from a place of fear and is a cry for help oh my goodness amanda when i when i read that i just you know thought of the dogs and horses that i had just punished and it was never hard but i realized then wait a minute, if this comes from fear, like, how can I bring that animal to a place where they're not threatened, and where they can come to a new way of being. And we realized as we started with this tea touch, which I'll, I'll give you the background of the telling to tea touch the work on the body, how that came about, but that we we could release fear at the cellular level with just by moving the tissue in this one and a quarter touches. Very interesting. And that we could give a dog a new sense of themselves by every inch of the body, doing these little touches in ways that they could accept. And um, by going down the legs and being able to lift the paws and doing all of these things that we do in such a way that the dog, wow, really fully comes into themselves. You know, the saying, I'm sure many of you who are listening to this have heard the saying, you know, I was so afraid I was out of my body. Mm -hmm. And I think when dogs like get really, really uh, with behavior that is not useful to us, not useful to them, they don't feel themselves. They're not grounded. They can't feel the ground. And so we have these all these different touches that affect the behavior through the work on the tail, through the gentle work on the ears, through the work around the mouth that affects the limbic system, the part of the brain that controls their emotions. Mm. So Linda, it reminds me of something. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it just reminds me of... Um, when you are balancing the right and the left hemisphere of your brain and you're taught to tap, you know, either tap on the body or want, you know, lift your right toes and then lift your left toes or switch your body back and forth and that will cue your body to reharmonize. It reminds me of the same thing. You're, especially in a moment of fight or flight, you're able to pull like the, so what is happening is the, is the mind pulls in the, like the, the consciousness kind of pulled back into the body is that's what's kind of happening there. Well, that's one thing that I'm sure is happening, but mm -hmm. there's something else that is at the heart of T-Touch. And that is um, how I got started in all of this. In For my 30th birthday in 1967, I saw an advertisement in the San Francisco Chronicle that said for $5, you could buy um, the, one of the first astrological charts done in a computer in Stanford University basement. Mm -hmm. So I sent away for it, and one of the statements in that little booklet I still have was that in my lifetime, I would develop a form of communication that would spread around the world. Wow. And in order to do so, I would have to learn to trust my intuition. Uh -huh. 
So I went to my husband's library and I pulled down a Rosicrucian book, just, you know, just reached up and pulled this book down, opened it up and said that intuition was unlearned knowledge. Now, of course, today we know it's knowledge that's in the quantum field, but that was a long time before we knew that. And so I just started listening for these signs and um, I started doing work on the body of horses in 1960 when my grandfather, whom I'd never met before because he was then 80 and, and had divorced my grandmother, taken care of her, but she didn't want to be at the racetrack and that's what he'd done his whole life. And um, he brought us a form of gypsy massage that he had learned in Russia when he was, um, as an American, uh, first um, riding as a jockey racehorses that was that were owned by an Austrian racehorse owner. This is in 1902. And then he liked it so much in Moscow, he stayed on and became a trainer. In 1905, he won the Capitan Award, the Tsar Nicholas II Award for the leading trainer in Moscow. And that means the most winners of that season. And he said he attributed his success to the fact that every horse in his stable was rubbed with these short little strokes over every inch of the body for 30 minutes a day by their grooms. And he said that he never entered a horse in a race unless it told him it was feeling fit enough to run well and to win. Isn't that interesting at that day and age? Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, he brought us this form of massage and for 15 years, we used this with our sport horses because I did a lot of 100 mile endurance riding. I set a record in 1961 that stood for seven years for 100 mile in one day endurance riding. And, um, and a lot of adventing and, and all, all the things you do with sport horses, we did it. And it really helped our horses recover faster after hard work, but it never can crossed my mind that you could actually um, affect the behavior of a horse by working on the body. Until in 1975, I had the, I was led by my angels, I know, not a question, to um, enroll in a four-year course at the Humanistic Psychology Institute with Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. And that was the only training that he actually was able to teach us the whole four summers. It was 12 weeks a summer. And in the second day of that course, Amanda, uh, I was like born again because he made a statement that it's possible for a human to learn in just very few experiences using very gentle, non-habitual movements of the body that would activate new neural pathways to the brain that would give us more potential as humans for learning because his passion was learning, not just movement. And when I heard that, it was the second day of the course, I remember lying on the floor doing, being led through these aware, this awareness movement. And I, like I pricked up my ears and I thought, wait a minute, if that's true for a horse, I mean, for a human, it's got to be true for a horse. Like all this idea in the horse world, you have to do something over and over and over with the horse in order to get them to learn because horses are slow learners and da da da. So anyway, I went out that very afternoon and I worked with a 16-year-old mare who had been a brood mare. She'd never been ridden, couldn't be caught easily. And I just started exploring different ways of moving her body gently. And she literally changed from a horse that couldn't be caught till that very day when the owner went out to catch her after I'd worked. She came to the gate for the first time and stood there like, do something to me. That was like, and I've been very successful in those days. I mean, we already had a, very, a book that was out in the world, a, horse, a book that was called uh, Physical Therapy and Massage for the Athletic Horse. It was the first book on body work that was published, we self-published in 1965, and then it was published by uh, Doubleday in 1971 as part of our another book that we wrote. And um, so I started on this track with the Feldenkrais work. And in the second year of the course, we had been, um, it had been recommended that we, one of our reading materials should be a book called Man on His Nature. It's still available on Amazon by Sir Charles Sherrington, a Nobel Prize winner for the discovery of photons. And I read 
he said that every cell, he wrote that every cell in the body knows its function within the body. And Amanda, when I, I can remember where I was sitting exactly in Morgan Pick restaurant in Stuttgart, Germany, and on a rainy day, and I, I put that book down and I thought, wait a minute, like the summer before, we had seen Moshe Feldenkrais do a miracle with a 28-year-old woman who'd had a stroke and was really had physical limitations of movement. And in 20 minutes, she could move completely differently. And we did not yet know how to do this. Of course, we learned that. But I thought in that moment, okay, all I have to do is talk to my cells and say, cells, just remind this body, whether it's a dog or a horse or a person, remind these cells of their potential for ideal function. Hmm. And I started seeing the body through my whole Feldenkrais training as a collection of cells. Hmm. And so I would, so what happened, I was very successful with the Feldenkrais work and my partner at the time, Roger Russell, who's today a very big Feldenkrais teacher, um, were working with, I was working with horses and Roger with the people with the Feldenkrais work for eight years, very successfully. And then in 1981, I had another visit from the, I used to think of it as the horse angels, but you know, it's just our angels coming out of the quantum field. And I was working on a really challenging horse at the, at the Delaware Veterinary Clinic. This mare owned, was owned by uh, one of the veterinarians. And in those days, they didn't do all the things with horses. <laughs> this is 1983. They only x-rayed from the knees and hawks down. And if you have any dog people who have horses listening to this, you'll know that, oh my goodness, today, I mean, vets have at their the possibility of all of the stuff that we do for people, but we didn't have it in those days. So I was asked, please, could I evaluate that horse? Because they didn't understand why it was that she hated to be groomed she wouldn't, she tried to bite or kick. Can you turn that light on, please? Tried to bite or kick you when you went to saddle her or groom her. And um, so I put my hands on her very, by the way, if that were a human, you would say, you would think she was probably suffering from fibromyalgia. That mm -hmm. goes up higher. Yeah. We're, we're, the sun is, the sun said, I wish you could see this. We're going to have to turn the lights on in a bit because. The sun is going down as I'm sharing this with you all. And um, so I put my hands on her in this very, just lift, just letting, giving the horse a sense of herself, just not expecting anything, just quietly giving her a sense of herself. And she got really quiet. And her owner said to me, okay, Linda, like, what are you doing? What is your secret? Are you using some sort of energy or what? And I intuitively said, don't worry what I'm doing. Just go up and put your hands on the shoulder and move the skin in a circle. And when I said that, Amanda, I thought, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> because it's not something that was part of what I did with horses. But I trust my intuition. I trust my angels. I trust divine spirit. And um, she went up and the horse got as quiet under her hands as under mine. And I thought, wow, it takes years to learn this wonderful Feldenkrais work. Anybody can move the tissue the skin in a circle. And that started me on that path of the circles. And it's been amazing. And, you know, when somebody said, okay, like, what's really behind this? I would just say, well, you know, we're, support we're, we're supporting the cellular intelligence. But I, I didn't know what that meant. And I was always on the search, what is the cellular intelligence? And um, in about 10 years ago, Bruce Lipton and, and, and Steve um, uh, Bar, Bar, oh no, I forget his last name at the moment, but a wonderful Steve, um, came out with a book called Spontaneous Evolution. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters in the book, and if you don't know this book, it's it's really, I recommend it to everybody. It's a slow read because there's a lot in it. And the ideas in one of these chapters, they write about the incredible ability of our cells to know 
the function in the body. I mean, it, we're like, we're walking miracles. But what's really behind this? And then as, of course, bless you, over the years, um, we found that with, it, with these one and a quarter circles, with all the different touches that we use, that we could actually release pain. And a person could do that themselves, not just for someone else. And you could change behavior. We could release fear. All of this stuff, just with this one and a quarter circles. And I kept thinking, what's really behind it? And um, then last year, uh, a year ago in August, I started teaching an online course for T-Touch for you, for humans. And for 18 years now in Germany and Germany, Austria and, and Switzerland, we've been teaching a three year course for uh, for therapists for T-Touch for you for humans. But I then started teaching it online for anyone for self help. And one of the books that um, just came intuitively into my hand was a book called the uh, the code of authentic living cellular wisdom. This is the key, and it really fits with what with what you do with people, because um, Joan King was for twenty years she was a cell biologist at Tufts University of Medicine and a researcher, and then one day she came upon a Hindu legend, and the legends changed her life. She left this field of research and began coaching. And this is one of her books. And in the first chapter, the first sentence is, every cell is a genius. And I thought, that's my book. <sighs> Wait a minute. Maybe she has the answer I've been searching for. What is the piece of the puzzle that's missing? How come? How come we can do a circle and a quarter and release fear? I just, like, three months ago, I have a compound fracture of my humerus and my elbow and a big sprain on my hand. And, you know, I'm like this today, <laughs> and no pain. How come? So what this legend is, it was said in this Hindu legend that at some point on the planet that every person was a god and could do anything. They could heal themselves. They could heal anything. Then people began to abuse the power. And so the chief Brahman thought, this cannot go on. We are going to have to take the power away from the people. And so they had this big powwow, and they met together, and somebody said, okay, we'll take it to the top of the highest mountain. We'll hide it there. No, no, they'll find it. Okay, we'll take it, to, we'll, we'll sink it in the deepest part of the ocean. No, they'll, they'll go there and find it. Not a problem. We'll go into a cave. We go deeper. Hide it there. No, they'll they'll find it. And then, the chief Brahmin said, "I know where we'll hide it. No one will ever find it there. We'll hide it inside every human." And that is why, when we acknowledge this, that every cell in the body is divine. It's part of the, all it is. It's part of divine consciousness. And when we start to get that and we recognize that, that we found with these one and a quarter touches, with this acknowledgement, whether I'm working on this beautiful little dog, that to see the perfection in ourselves and in every being, that's when we can bring release this fear and bring this feeling of knowing that mm -hmm. we're all part of the all we're all divine mm -hmm. and that's at the heart of the sea touch with dogs so mm -hmm. this little being like when oh, she's snoring. <laughs> were you snoring yep little snoop so when i look at a person and this is this is a, what i feel is the secret behind tea touch or I look at an animal, I don't care what they have or what they look like. I just see their perfection at the cellular level. I see their beauty. And when we begin to look at animals like that, 
and realize the gifts they bring us and the opportunity for us to learn, to be patient, to, you know, learn to, to listen, to feel, and to love ourselves hmm. in the process. This is a great gift. And that's what I feel our dogs, as I know you feel, they're such a gift in our lives. And we have the, the techniques of the Tellington T-Touch method and the philosophy that sees all beings as divine and perfect. Mm, it's beautiful. I love to you talk about it and explain it. It's so deep and so soulful and universal. You know, it's so expansive, and yet it's very practical. And that's what's extremely unique, I think, about Tea Touch is yes. as kind of um, scientific and profound, it's also just, you know, also very simple touch and love, love as a healing force. Yes, and, and the thing is you don't have to understand the science or the spirituality behind it, but it's a great gift when you do, but you can be successful just by learning the techniques and each person then in their own way will be brought to whatever is perfect for them. And I just, I so appreciate, like we have all these, I use this little brush because she's concerned about being touched on the body because she has arthritic pain mm -hmm. and she's in a strain. She doesn't know me. She's never been in this house before. So of course she's very like, what am I going to do? So I started with a little blanket. She has an extra one. I just took it and, and just started with these little touches like this, just mm -hmm. like that, you know, and then only a couple of them. And then licking my lips and blinking and looking away and using my, my calming signals, my body language to show her that hmm, I will listen to her. If she's afraid, I'm not going to force her. I'm just going to give her the opportunity to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I know that if we can, that's a very good girl. I think it's too much for her to actually work her little ears. So I'm going to show you on the little helper that I have. Let me just see. I'm going to show you. Um, first of all, you asked me like how people can learn this right before, right? Yeah. So that's my second edition of the dog book. And um, we have a video that you can uh, get on our library. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And this is um, another book all wrapped up that my sister Robin Hood put together. And these wraps that we use on dogs are amazing. How just this little, this, this, these are very complicated wraps, but the simplest wrap um, is what we call the half wrap. And, and it's just so interesting how just having this little, I don't know if you can see it in this light, but you know, we can post it after, right? Yeah. We can post a little picture so yeah. that you see it. Just a simple half wrap uh -huh. that gives the dog boundaries makes such a difference. And I'm going to just get up a moment and get this little helper that I have. Okay. Now I have to be careful. You have to cover her because she'll think this is a real dog and she'll, yeah. Yeah. This is my little helper dog. <laughs> Buffy, this is Buffy. Buffy's very well behaved. Yes, he's there. He's, he likes doing this. He likes teaching. Huh? Uh -huh. And so some of the things that we found is that just with the lightest touches, you can go over the whole body and we have like 20 different ways of parts of the hand that we use that we've given animal names. You know, it's the, like uh, that with the, with the first part of the pads, that's the clouded leopard. And if your dog is really afraid at first, you just use the back of your hand very, um, you know, gently. That's the llama touch, and that uh, they all come from animals that I've worked on. It was mm -hmm. came from a, a llama whose ears you couldn't touch. It's a whole other story. And then we found out, like, say I'm working, I don't know if I could, on this side of the dog, 
and it's not comfortable to use your fingers. So you just fold your fingers over and gently use the back of the fingers. And, and that's what we call the baby orangutan. And they, like I say, they all have reasons for, um, and, and animals I've worked with with this, um, to give them the names. Now, what's important from, I think it was from the universal point of understanding and yoga and all it is, is it nowadays um, something that's being talked about? I don't know if have you heard of this concept of the nature syndrome, uh, nature um, deprivation syndrome? No, not it's it's a new concept that we 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 have an integrative doctor that gives classes like uh, um, for for in in plant based eating. And that's part of the teachings is that, you know, to get out in nature, to feel a part of nature in order to be really healthy. And that it's a big problem now, mm -hmm. especially with kids. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. So, of course, anyone who has dogs, they're getting their dogs out to walk, most people. So you get out there. But this idea that we would give the parts of the hand animal names, when I put my hands on it, on a dog and I think of the clouded leopard, I think of the little leopard that I worked on in the Los Angeles Zoo many years ago, who'd been um, rejected by her mother. And we talk about that. And so as you're using these different touches, it puts us in connection in spirit in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that activates the right brain. Mm -hmm. And in order to be fully human, we need an activation of both left and right hemisphere, mm -hmm. as you well know, right? Mm -hmm. Without the left logic, we couldn't be on this. We couldn't be on our uh, on our iPads like this. Mm -hmm. But without the right brain, which brings us feeling and intuition and compassion and creativity, without that, we're not fully human at all. And that's what T-Touch does in every one and a quarter circle. It's that activation of both both hemispheres. Wow. Because we have a logical method of doing the work. And we imagine the face of a clock. And on the clock, we, have the, we put the numbers. So whenever you put numbers, I'll activate the logical part of the brain. So we, brain. So we have numbers 6, you know, 9, 12, and 3 on the clock. That activates, oh, yeah, that left brain logic. But we imagine the face of the clock. And we imagine the connection with these animal spirits as we do the work. And that activates this beautiful feeling, compassion, creativity, intuition. So that's what's behind all of this work. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's fascinating. I could ask you about 10,000 questions right now, but I won't, I won't keep us here for the next year. But I do have one question. Does it work on all animals? Yes. You mean on all species? Yes. Yes. I mean, I, you know, I think the most interesting question, one of the interesting questions I had many years ago, for 10 times I went to the former Soviet Union as a citizen diplomat with um, Esalen Institute, bringing, putting our people together without, without politics. Mm. And I led a group in Gorky Park, a group of, from the Club Healthy family um, in a guided journey to find a spirit animal who would be their protector. And um, one little boy asked, well, my spirit animal was a snail. So how can I touch a snail? And I said, you can touch it with your mind and your heart. Mm. And it's really interesting, Amanda, because he was, he told me this story when he was in the, uh, quite a few years later, when I, I was in contact with this young man. And at that point, he was, I forget what grade he was in, but he remembered that. And we can reach out to the animals around the planet and all the dogs, you know, who don't have the love that we give our dogs. We can reach out and send this love and appreciation to them. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, we absolutely can. And it's such a powerful way to do that. You know, so many of us animal lovers do want to serve. We want to help. It's deep within us to be able to do that, even feeling that that is the reason we're here, our dharma, our purpose, and yet may not know the ways in which to do that. And that's what really um, you've offered so many people all around the world for so many years. So that, and that's what I wanted to explore next um, before we wrap this up is it sounds to me like if we're interested, if our listeners are interested, first learning through your website, ttouch.com, through your videos, through your books, like learning for yourself, and then becoming aware that if we're really feeling aligned to it, there are practitioners that in the training that you can undergo and become certified in this technique. And then you connect people all around the world to those practitioners. Is that correct? Well, yes. And you can also just go to a practitioner to get help with your animal or to yeah. just to do a one day or a weekend workshop and get a new relationship. Uh -huh. It's not just for the certification. Yeah, And um, uh, that's what I, I think is just so fantastic is to come to a place where you have the techniques to work with that dog who is barking and you can't stop him or those that dog is jumping up on a person that maybe isn't, you know, is older and not not so happy about dogs jumping up on you or these dogs that pull on a leash and can really hurt themselves but also their person at the end of the leash. We have really practical, easy to teach methods of uh, working in this way. And that's, you can, so it's not, not, not just to become certified, it's just to be with your animal. Yeah. So also one of the things that we have, I, I have a, you can go to my website, ttouch.com, ttouch.com. Um, and if you're, um, you can also see something that we've been doing online since we started last August. We first did a 90-day online immersion in T-Touch for You course, and it was like once a month for three hours on Saturday and three on Sunday, we, we, we did T-Touch for You. And what we found, Amanda, I mean, I'm so excited about this education on our computers because I can get across every bit as well the science and spirituality and techniques of the detouch right like we are here even as well as a, maybe even better than across the room because we have this connection and i work with these on the online course for, for humans i work with sandy rakowitz and eleanor um, silverstein and they've been doing this work for 30 years now with detouch for for their horses and dogs and for humans and so it's one way to learn. Now, we also, I'm really excited. We have what's called the Tellington T on Facebook. We have the Tellington Tea Touch World and Tellington Tea Touch Community. And the community is, um, you can join it for like $9.95 a month. And if you like Facebook, I mean, every, um, almost every single week we have a webinar for dogs, cats, horses, donkeys different and humans and different aspects of the work and if you don't like facebook you can go into the library and just go directly into it and um and get access to my videos and all these webinars that we're doing so it's a way of sharing and this way i so appreciate being with you and being able to share like this with your people well, thank you, Linda. My gosh, I can't thank you enough. You really are. You're like the godmother of this work, healing animals and and not just healing them, as we've said, through kind of these practical techniques, but healing them and ourselves at such a deeper soulful level. And we all know that that's what the world needs. And animals are absolutely our teachers of that. That's what they're on this planet to do. And um, you've given us such a framework, such a map to use to be able to do that. Um, so first of all, just thank you so much for your time and for all that you have put into this throughout your long journey. And um, I, I want to just mention that the, the 22 books that you've, been, that you've written have been translated into 15 languages. So right there, just showing the, the breadth of your work and the, the, the reach that it's had um, to so many different people and places and animals as you've shared all over around the world. So it's, it's amazing. 
And I encourage everyone to definitely learn more. I'm going to. I'm definitely going to continue to watch and, and learn and experience through the resources that you have. There's so many. There's no reason not to. <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to meeting you and sharing. And I know that you have a wonderful connection with Deepak Chopra. And he is one of my heroes, as you can well imagine. I mean, he brings so much to the world. Uh, Great pleasure to be with you. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's been an honor and thank you for taking the time to do this. And please extend our gratitude to your your crew there, including the little furry one, <laughs> but all that yeah. have helped us with today and making this happen. Thank you. We appreciate <laughs> you. Love to all of you friends. We'll be in touch. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha.